Well, uh, in the first part of this webinar, uh, we discuss a little bit about the uh, challenges and uh, perspectives in Brazil from uh, the Commission of make the commissioning of subsea structures and floating structures. Um, for the whole chain of the commissioning, we have also the plug and abandon of wells that have be, been considered like uh, the most expensive phase of the decommissioning um, chain. So in this second part of the webinar, uh, we will focus in PNA and um, we plan three parts for this webinar. In the first part, we um, called uh, where we are and how big is our challenge. So we will invite uh, the regulators for both countries to present to us the status. First, we will have um, the Brazilian, the Norwegian regular, regulator and then the Brazilian regulator. Afterwards, we uh, will have a second session that is uh, related with how uh, oil companies are overcoming current challenges in PNA, and we will have a short presentation from NORS, uh, uh, a presentation for um, um, Equinor, uh, Norway, and a presentation from Repsol in Brazil. And to close the webinar, we will have a couple of presentations from the University of Estavanger and from uh, Sintef, uh, where they are going to present new projects uh, that have uh, involvement of both countries that are starting uh, this year, uh, and they are going to present to us what are the goals and what is the objective uh, with this cooperation with Brazil. Uh, so to uh, start, um, well, before uh, inviting uh, Nina, I would like to uh, say to everyone, everyone that we will have an uh, option to receive your questions in the comments, and we will have half hour uh, after the complete set of presentations to answer your questions. So first, I would like to invite Nina uh, Rigoen. She is the um, uh, representative of the Petroleum Safety Authority in Norway. Uh, so welcome, Nina, and the public it is with you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll try to share my screen with you. Okay. I will confirm to you when we are able to see your slides. So yeah, so just uh, we need to put a full screen. Yeah, now it's yeah. perfect. Okay, that sounds good. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, my name is uh, Nina Ringen. I work in the drilling and well technology uh, department in the Petroleum Safety Authority in Norway. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, to give a brief uh, introduction to uh, Petroleum Safety Authority, uh, our regulations and a link to NORSUC D010, uh, which is revision 5, which is currently out on hearing. Uh, also, uh, the surveys we have done with respect to number of wells in operation and uh, temporary abandoned wells. Uh, and our requirements uh, with respect to qualification of new technology and new materials for permanent abandonment, in addition to a technology roadmap from the Norwegian oil and gas. So, uh, uh, the Petroleum Safety Authority in Norway, we have been a safety regulator since uh, 1973. Uh, in the beginning, we were together with the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate. Uh, we did, however, split up in 2004. Uh, and since then, the PSA has had a regulatory responsibility for safety and the working environment in uh, Norway's petroleum sector. Uh, we report to the Ministry of Labour and Social Affairs, and we are about uh, 180 employees uh, and are positioned uh, in Ullanhau in Stavanger in Norway. Our uh, overall goal is to set the terms uh, for supervising that the players in the petroleum sector maintain a high standard for health, safety, the environment and emergency preparedness and thereby also contribute to creating the greatest uh, possible value for society. 
when it comes to uh, our regulations uh, they are uh, based on uh, performance requirements or what we call uh, functional requirements uh, that means that we have been given the authority by our ministry to develop the regulations and thereby also contribute to uh, uh, through our guidance level uh, to implement approved policies and standards as uh, as Norsuk D of TAN. And in our guidance level, uh, we use the word should um, when we recommend a way uh, uh, of fulfilling the functional uh, requirements in the regulations. And the intention with the functional requirements is to give the industry the freedom to choose good solutions for itself. And by referring to norms and industry standards in our guidance level, uh, we provide predictability for the users and indicate the standard which solutions are expected to meet uh, to fulfill the requirements. In addition, the regulations uh, require the companies to establish risk targets and manage their activities in relation to this. Uh, one example is the activity regulations uh, section 85, uh, which is uh, dealing with uh, well barriers. And it states that uh, there, during drilling and well activities, uh, there shall be tested well barriers with sufficient independence. Uh, and again, in our guidance level, we refer to NORSOC D of 10, uh, chapters 4.2, etc. Uh, by the wording should be used uh, to fulfill the requirements in uh, activity 85. Uh, I've also added a link in yellow to, uh, to the regulations on our website. When it comes to, uh, to the, the reference in the guidance level to NORSOC D of 10, this is uh, a very busy slide. It's uh, a draft version of the new revision of NORSOC D of 10, the revision 5, uh, and the table 1, which is related to, to well barriers and uh, activity regulations, uh, section 85. Uh, as you might see, the table is, uh, is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of details, uh, but still the minimum number of barriers is said to be uh, operating with two defined barriers against overpressure and flow potential. Uh, the table is uh, divided into normal pressure, overpressure, and different uh, sources of inflow, in addition to minimum number of well barriers. Uh, in this webinar, we are focusing on, uh, on the permanent lagging and abandonment. Um, for a reservoir, there are still uh, the requirement for two barriers. Uh, when it comes to overburden formations or interval with limited flow potential, as you might see on the, the last drawing, uh, the general rule of thumb is, is two barriers, but there is a little note there stating that for uh, overburden formations uh, with limited flow potential, a risk assessment uh, demonstrating an acceptable risk level as a one less a barrier might be acceptable uh, and same for uh, for an interval with no flow potential in uh, in overburden the general principle is uh, one barrier uh, but again uh, note 80 stating that for overburden formations with no flow potential uh, one less barrier might be acceptable after a risk assessment uh, but still there will be a requirement for an open hole to surface uh, plug. So this was just a, a little uh, teaser with respect to uh, the new NORSO provision, which might uh, be published uh, early 2021. Still, this is, uh, this is a draft version.
Uh, when it comes to, to permanent plugging and abandonment uh, in our activity regulations, uh, section 88, uh, we have our requirements with respect to securing wells. Uh, and it states that all wells shall be secured before they are abandoned so that well integrity is safeguarded during the time uh, they are left or with respect to eternity. It shall also be possible to check uh, well integrity in the event of reconnection on temporarily abandoned wells. And for subsea completed wells, uh, well integrity shall be monitored if the plan is to abandon the wells for more than 12 months. In 2014, we made some, uh, some changes to the regulations, stating that uh, exploration wells, uh, commenced after 2014 shall not be temporarily abandoned beyond two years and production wells uh, with how carbon bearing zone shall be plugged and abandoned permanently within three years if the well is not continuously monitored with respect to to those changes to temporary abandoned wells uh, we do surveys of, uh, of the numbers on the Norwegian continental shelf uh, approximately every second year. Uh, and we, we ask the operators to categorize them according to the Norwegian Oil and Gas uh, Guideline 117 for well integrity, as you might see here with respect to green, yellow, orange and red wells. And um, the number has been relatively stable for the last uh, four years. Still, there are wells uh, uh, that are entered into the survey and wells that are kind of also permanently plugged or, or used for slot recoveries. Um, what we have seen now in 2020 is that the number of green wells have slightly decreased and the number of uh, yellow uh, orange and red wells have slightly increased. Uh, and we do follow uh, the red and, and orange wells uh, particularly with respect to, to the operators uh, that are responsible for securing them permanently. Uh, when it comes to, to monitoring of the per, uh, temporary abandoned wells, also 90% of, uh, of the wells have monitoring as per today uh, and 80 percent of the wells uh, do also have plans with respect to permanent abandonment or, or reuse for the future uh, when it comes to the total number of wells of uh, on the norwegian continental sector today we are around 2000 wells or 2063 uh, from january uh, 2019 uh, and as you might see here um, the number of wells uh, on injection is 376 uh, on production 1397 uh, and when it comes to the temporary abandoned wells they uh, they change a little bit from from year to year but uh, with monitoring there there was 168 in 2019 and 122 uh, without uh, monitoring. So there will be work uh, also going forward or a high activity level when it comes to securing these uh, wells in the end. Uh, this slide is showing uh, statistics from uh, the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate. Uh, as you might see here, the blue bar is uh, wells or well bores that are plugged and reused for slot recoveries uh, and the orange bar are wells that are permanently abandoned. Uh, this uh, trends only go until July 2019 so I know we have got some more uh, permanently abandoned wells since then but still uh, the trend is showing that uh, the primarily also primarily the well bores are, are still reused for slot recovery on the NCS. When it comes to qualification of uh, new technology and new materials, we do support 
the qualification and uh, use of new technology and new materials uh, as long as they uh, are uh, also within the same safety level and as robust as uh, ex the existing technolo technology and materials we have available. Um, we also have uh, as uh, one of our goals that uh, we should contribute to uh, create uh, the greatest possible value for society which means that uh, we also support uh, more cost efficient solutions. Uh, when it comes to the qualification process itself, uh, we normally refer to facility regulations uh, section 9, uh, which states that uh, there shall be uh, criteria drawn up for development, testing and use so that the requirements uh, for HSC are fulfilled when one are planning to take new technology and new materials in use. And the criteria shall be representative for the relevant conditions of use and adapted to already accepted solutions like, for example, uh, verification as mentioned in uh, North of DO10. Uh, we also refer to DNV, RP, A203, qualification for new technology, and UK oil and gas uh, qualification of, uh, of new material. And examples of, uh, of new technology and new materials on the NCS is uh, perf, uh, wash and cement, use of shale as a barrier, and, uh, and recently also use of uh, bismuth. Uh, last uh, but not least, uh, this is just a flavor of uh, the roadmap for new p and technologies from the Norwegian Oil and Gas Association, uh, where all the operators meet regularly to discuss uh, progress and, uh, and new technology and new materials for p and uh, And this is uh, kind of an old version, but as you might see, they are moving from uh, conventional rig operations to, to more uh, kind of rigless and high capacity systems uh, with, uh, with new kind of energy or melting uh, solutions when it comes to, to P&A material. Uh, in addition to improved uh, verification methods as qualification matrices and um, new logging methods. So I know this uh, roadmap is uh, being updated as we speak, uh, but still I think it's important to have some goal to, to work towards uh, when it comes to new technology and new materials. Okay, thank you very much. That was all from me. Uh, thank you, Nina, so much for your presentation. Um, we will have probably some questions later on. So now I would like to invite your counterpart in Brazil, uh, that is Mariana França from the Brazilian Agency of Petroleum. Hi, Mari. Hello. I um, I just want you to confirm that I shared my screen. Yeah, sure. Is there everything fine? Yeah, it's going very nice. Uh, yeah, okay. I can see now your screen, so uh, the audience is with you now. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Uh, it's a pleasure to be invited to talk a little about, about the Brazilian um, plug and abandonment overview. And um, thank you to introduce myself. I'm here representing the Operational Safety and Environmental Superintendency of the Brazilian um, Petroleum, Natural Gas, and Biofuels uh, National Agency. And um, for this presentation today, I plan to talk a little bit about the Brazilian regulatory frameworks and the uh, wells activities overview. I will uh, for sure talk about the PNA that uh, we have in Brazil and some challenges we have regarding this activity. And I will close with uh, final remarks uh, and the regulator main um, concerns regarding PNA. So first of all, just to put everyone on the same page, regarding the regulatory framework for well integrity in Brazil, 
we have um, as the first uh, regulation for well integrity management system what we call SGIP. It was published in 2016. It had um, some time of adequacy. And I can tell you that uh, after uh, adequacy period for onshore uh, wells operator and offshore wells operator, we have uh, since last November, all operators working in Brazil already um, following, complying with the SJP. And uh, besides well integrity, as uh, it, this uh, regulation was based on um, international best practices, so it's very um, similar to PSA regulations, uh, which uh, talks about all the management practices passing through um, training, risk analysis, management of change, and also passing through all requirements for RELs since uh, design phase to uh, plug and abandonment. But besides the SGAP, we have other um, uh, operational safety regulations that uh, the operators in Brazil have to comply with. Uh, we have the well data regulation, which is from 2006, 2017. And all operators, they have to comply sending some well data to ANP to follow up their activities and also to verify if they are complying with SJP. So ANP can uh, verify that from uh, office instead of going in each operator um, office or even uh, in the location of the activity. And uh, regarding PNA, all the design phase and also the PNA as it was uh, done have to be sent to ANP to verification. And also the decommissioning regulation, which is the newest uh, operational safety regulation we have that was published this year, 2020, also has some, add some uh, requirements regard, uh, regarding PNA. Uh, which is, requires um, cut and removal for all wells that is under uh, uh, 100 meters uh, water level and also for all onshore wells. And uh, our first, first uh, regulation, which is called SGSO, uh, it's required that the management, operational safety management system required for all uh, offshore rigs. So uh, when we talk about well barriers like a BOP and our training of personnel on board, we are talking about this regulation, which is from 2017. So the well integrity management system regulation was very based on this SGSO. And just to you to be aware, uh, SGSO is under revision. So we're probably um, publishing a new regulation for rigs and uh, production platforms next year. And also to follow up all the well uh, integrity and wells activities, we have um, a regulation regarding the incident communication and investigation. So any uh, failure of uh, well barriers or any well barrier operating uh, over the envelope of integrity, uh, we uh, NP is communicated. And if uh, any leakage really happens, we have a uh, if, if we have an incident, um, we uh, will also require, require investigation. So sometimes we um, ANP investigate itself, but it will also receive the investigation from all operators. And uh, from those investigations, we also publish some safety alerts. And uh, besides, we have uh, on one regulation from 2015, the number 37, which shows all requirements for ANP um, audits and supervision. So we are based on um, performance-based regulations, based on management system practices, and uh, our audits, if, if we do not have any um, urgent risk, we uh, give uh, non-conformance, we, we give some um, time for the operators to um, to fix their non-conformities and to comply with our regulations. So besides this uh, regulatory framework, just to give you an overview of our numbers, in Brazil, we have 30,000 wells considered in 
onshore and offshore. From those 30,000, have 7,000 uh, offshore wells, and 20% of those wells are uh, in production. Well, right now, we have uh, 11 offshore oil operators and much more uh, in onshore, 30, 33 uh, onshore oil operators. Uh, we are passing through uh, Petrobras disinvestment, so especially onshore and in shallow waters, Petrobras are selling their assets for other several operators. And uh, for offshore, uh, for those 11 offshore oil operators, we have nine rig contractors operating, but the majority working for Petrobras. As you can see, uh, we are not different from the uh, international perspective. Uh, the number of offshore rigs operating in Brazil have been decreasing, but um, we expect this number to increase even with the COVID, the pandemic time this year, we increase a little bit uh, if we compare the number of rigs operating in 2018 and 2019, especially because we, um, we've done several um, uh, offerings, uh, bids last years, and we also have this process of Petrobras disinvestment, so we have other operators investing in drilling more wells and doing some uh, workovers. So just to have a view for drilling, uh, we I'm showing here a uh, number of wells per semester per, per year. We've seen that uh, this year, the number of drilling activities, even in pandemic times increased, especially for production and development wells, exploratory wells have been uh, decreasing uh, uh, last years. The workover uh, have been decreasing the activity, but uh, completion and well testing uh, have been also uh, increasing uh, the activities since the operators are investing more in uh, production development wells. For onshore wells, well, for workover, it's another level. We have a lot of workover in, in onshore wells, especially because those operators um, buying assets now doing the transfer of rights with petrobras they are investing in work over instead of uh, new drilling wells we have been uh, seeing a uh, decreasing on on drilling in onshore but uh, completion and well testing the numbers should uh, in our database should uh, increase in 2020. but regarding uh pna we've seen uh, a decrease on permanent uh, pna last uh, two years, but in 2020, we uh, maybe from um, uh, regulatory, the new regulation SJP consequence, we've seen uh, the operators uh, doing the permanent PNA last years, but uh, this this graph shows just really PNA activities, because if you consider as the main uh, activity, work over drilling completion, and well testing, we also have the PNA at the end of those activities in some cases. So here you can see the main activity in green, and when we have the PNA in blue for 2020. And when we talk about well status, every month, every uh, month up to the 15th uh, day, we receive all those all Brazilian wells status. So if the well is not permanent abandonment, the operator have uh, to update the NP every month of the real well status. Um, and we can see that uh, in Brazil, if we consider the light blue color, the pink and the purple, we are have a lot of uh, temporary abandonment wells, wells that are waiting for a uh, permanent uh, PNA. Regarding the time, the average time of uh, PNA uh, activities, uh, considering those that the uh, operator go there, go to the well just to permanent PNA, we have an average of 36 days for offshore PNA and uh, 18 days for onshore. But what we've been uh, concerned and discussing a lot with the operators is the new requirement that SJP brought of maximum of three years of uh, temporary abandonment wells without any monitoring. We know that uh, we have to uh, improve the quality 
control of our database. We've seen that the major operator Petrobras had to fix around 800 wells status and uh, reports that the, our regulation require. So after SJP, they uh, you realize that some wells that were as temporary abandonment in our da database were actually permanent abandonment. So we are fixing our database, but we are also pushing the industry to comply with uh, maximum three years of uh, temporary abandonment without any monitoring. So we've been uh, sending um, letters to, to the operators to fix that, but we are also doing some compliance to quality control our database and to uh, have a reliable uh, data to, to also uh, take some uh, information from all the data we require and we have. Also, uh, since ANP is not a um, really old agency, uh, it's just from 1998, and we have several wells that were drilled and uh, produced before 1998. We have several wells that in the past were assigned for water abstraction. They were originally oil and gas wells, and they were um, passed through to other activities. And uh, since the original purpose of those wells were for oil and gas, NP is also pushing the uh, original operators to PNA uh, those wells and to have a reliable database. Oops, sorry. So as I mentioned throughout my um, presentation, we are working hard to have a reliable database. And we have also to uh, push the operators to first fix their own database and um, afterwards give us uh, reliable data to have the reliable uh, overview of wells in Brazil. Also, in the last years, we've seen that a uh, permanent PNA was not the priority. Um, they were uh, putting a lot of wells in temporary abandonment, especially without any monitoring, and we're also pushing the industry to um, have technologies to monitor those wells. So we also facilitate all this intense uh, flow that we have of transfer of rights. So Petrobras is uh, uh, focusing uh, in the main, um, in the main uh, fields and blocks they have, especially uh, pre-south and offshore. And we have uh, new operators uh, coming from for those uh, new as for those uh, shallow water and onshore assets, and uh, they have SGIP to comply with. So especially especially for this transfer of rights um, uh, process, we are pushing the new operators to have a re really good dual diligence, also uh, verifying all the well data, especially for those old wells that are uh, the operators sometimes does not have really reliable data to uh, verify if there is any uh, integrity issue that the new operator have to um, be aware before they uh, become the new operator of those assets. And we also uh, have a regulation and also a manual for the industry to guarantee an adequate well handover between uh, uh, old operators and the new ones that are coming. So just to summarize what I want to uh, give you as a final remarks, uh, NP is really uh, uh, focusing on transparency and, and we think data is knowledge. So we are really um, publishing those uh, Power BI panels for the industry. We want to share everything we have, but for wells especially, we have to rely on our data. So we are, um, doing audits and uh, working with the operators to fix our data. We also rely on in cooperation, exchange, and mutual support. So we are working with uh, operators, associations, service company associations, uh, even international, and also PSA to exchange knowledge, to require data for the industry, just what, what is really um, necessary. And also, uh, we want to have uh, those reliable data 
to um, improve our audits, to focus really on what what really is really matter, what is critical, and it's important to guarantee well integrity. So we want to have the view that Nina showed um, that shows which wells are critical and uh, have issues on integrity. So what we are focusing uh, right now is to guarantee that those uh, drilling activities that are increasing in number and all the wells activities are uh, that continues in a safety um, way, in a safe way, even with the pandemic and COVID-19 restrictions we have right now. And uh, as I mentioned in the last slide, we want to guarantee compliance and adequate well handovers considering the intense process we have right now of transfer of rights, especially from Petrobras to new and smaller uh, operators. So that's what I want to share to share with you. And um, I'm open for questions at the end uh, of our session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mariana. A very good presentation. Uh, well, now we are going to move forward to the second part of this panel. So I will um, share with you a short presentation and then we will have Repsol and Ekiner. Okay, so, um, well, my name is Catherine Beltran. I work at NORS as a research scientist. And here we have a, a program that we call the PNA Innovation Program. Uh, that is a program to accelerate the development of technology for for PNA. Uh, so uh, this is more my personal overview. Um, I would like to highlight that uh, currently we have 100% of the wells in Brazil or Norway. We have 100% of cement in the annulus uh, behind the casing strings. Um, and also that uh, it's quite common to have integrity problems as Nina uh, present uh, in, the, in the Norwegian uh, statistics. So uh, this 40 and 50% uh, number, it's uh, of wells around the world. Uh, so 40, uh, between 40 and 50% of the wells have integrity issues. That means that you see uh, fluids or you see gas that is uh, on the world head. So uh, that means that the barriers that you place on the wall uh, are not containing the fluids. So when we talk about barriers and two barriers, uh, we are talking about different uh, elements. We have the internal plugs that we place, we have the uh, casings, we have the annular cement, and we have the formation. Um, so um, I think that we have four basic um, or four big groups where we can uh, we have needs to develop technologies. So the first uh, of these um, uh, topics is uh, barrier verification and repair. So uh, how we can uh, assess that the cement that is placed already in, in our wells have good integrity. So I think that exists a necessity to, to develop uh, non-destructive destructive technologies uh, for for doing this assessment. We need also, if we have integrity problems, we have a necessity to have new materials to treat those, uh, those problems, like for example, channels, fractures, um, migration of fluids, how we can uh, release the pressure on those uh, places, for example. Um, as um, Nina and Mariana comment, uh, we, we have also um, nowadays a good, developing of uh, logging tools, but we still have capacity to improve these logging tools and to understand better the uncertainties related with the logging tools. And also another topic is when we have more of uh, one case in a string, how we can uh, process and trust that the readings that we have of, of, of our cement are, um, are real. Um, uh, they mentioned as well that we are moving as industry for a rigless operation. So I think that we have uh, four uh, main points there. That is first access and placement of barriers when we have, for example, tubing strings inside or when we have cables inside uh, the wall. So this is the first, the second technologies that um, allow us to uh, remove uh, sections with problems as for example, PWC, perforate uh, wash, wash and cement. 
um, and how we can deal with the possibility to uh, keep and left behind uh, the tubing and the lines that we have on the walls, where how we identify the places where we have the lines and how we uh, can be able to cut and abandon the walls with these lines. Uh, I think that the, another big topic is materials, um, but we have to deal now as an industry in these 9,000 wells that Marianne and Nina mentioned that we have cement. So uh, degradation, it's, uh, it's uh, still an issue and, um, and we, we need to deal with that, but we have opportunity to develop new, new materials like as, for example, geopolymers, resin, silicates, bismuth, um, and different groups are working as well with the, uh, the use of chips shales and salt, salt layers that we have in the overboard and to, to act as barriers. Um, but uh, I think that the um, new materials, um, if we think in new materials for the internal plug, we are uh, still in the possibility to do it, but we uh, still have to deal with the cement that we placed 30, 40 years ago on the walls. So um, I, the last point, um, I think that is uh, as industry, we need to start to think in um, planning uh, for abandonment, so uh, we need to. When we when we drill wells uh, on the past, we were thinking in how to uh, optimize the design in order to improve the production. But we never we we never think in the in the abandoned phase. So I think that we have an opportunity as industry to to uh, redesign our wells for abandon and, uh, for example, have a better idea of where we can place our barriers. And also long-term monitoring, as uh, as Marianne and Nina show. So uh, just uh, short comments about the program that we have here uh, at North in Stavanger. So uh, we have been working since 2012 um, in research in PNA. Uh, we have several papers. Um, uh, where we present our full scale experiments, uh, the, the experiments that we did between 2012 and 2018. But I think that the most representatives are uh, um, these four. So we have experience with the uh, leakage testing of um, pipes where we uh, have the tubing inside and we cement everything and we uh, compare where were the leakage rates when we have um, the tubing and when we re remove the tubing. Um, we have a lot of uh, research as well in technologies for barrier evaluation, mostly logging. Um, we have some uh, um, experience with uh, cementing in irregular well bores. So, for example, when we have washouts or different geometries inside the wall. Uh, and also we have research with the risk assessment of PNA walls. So some of our facilities, uh, we have a, a full scale offshore uh, drilling rig that can be skid to have access, access for uh, eight wells. And we have our one well that is fully dedicated to PNA activities when we can place materials uh, and recover these sections to analyze how was the, the placement of these materials. Um, we have also um, mixing and cementing uh, unit uh, and pumpings to reproduce offshore facilities so we can test um, uh, simulating real conditions. Um, well, as I mentioned, we have the PNA innovation program that was actually started in 2018. And we are focused in um, help operators and service companies to prove uh, PNA technology and to accelerate the file introduction of this technology on uh, real operations. So uh, this program, um, in this program, we have um, six uh, main projects. Uh, and we are working close to five operators. We have uh, Aker BP, that is a Norwegian operator, that is um, an operator quite, um, I think that one of the operators that is uh, leading the technology development uh, of new solutions. We have Konoko Philips um, in Norway as well. They are working uh, in different areas. Uh, I think that logging is one of the strongest areas that they have. Um, uh, working on. We have um, um, Total in Norway as well. Um, and we have close cooperation with Total in Brazil. Um, I think that they they are um, uh, quite interested as well in logging and verification and uh, 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 trying to challenge a little bit how we can, um, we can abandon with tubing and lines. 
Uh, we have as well Shell, uh, the operations in uh, the operator in, in the Netherlands. Uh, they have quite a, a large experience in develop, uh, developing of technology. And um, for example, we have we can see here in the project number two, this, the fluid migration. They are developing a, a tool that can expand the cement and the, the casing inside and the cement, and we can treat, for example, microannually or uh, leakage pads that we have. Um, we have also the Petroleum Safety Authority, that means the Norwegian regulator that is working close to us to follow up all the developing that we are uh, working on. And we have Petrobras that uh, uh, as part of us or our group. Um, and I think that for Petrobras, um, it, they are they are quite interested in uh, move forward forward with the light interventions and open sea abandon. Um, so for our um, portfolio, uh, uh, the first project is more uh, we call Balhal sandwich sections. As as I mentioned, one hundred percent of the walls have cement in the annular space. So one of these operators they donate um, some sections that were recovered from a uh, well thirty years old. And we did several analysis of leakage, durability. Uh, we have seven papers that were published related with this uh, work. In fluid migration modeling and treatment, uh, we are uh, trying to understand the flow paths, the typical uh, problems of integrity that we have and we can how we can treat um, those um, uh, issues uh, that can be with fluids or, as resins or it can be with mechanical uh, tools, for example, uh, as that one that I previously mentioned. Uh, we have the full scale PNA test. So we have uh, the rig and seven wells, as I mentioned, and one well that is fully dedicated to PNA activities. And we have, um, we are finishing the construction of a um, uh, cell 10 meters long to test different materials for PNA. In verification of PNA barriers, we work with different several institutions in uh, service companies uh, that work with locks, um, then uh, sonic lock, um, noise locks, the, several uh, several technologies. Um, as of pre or, or previous program uh, between 2012 and 2018, we, we continue with this risk standard uh, acceptance criteria and we have close in this specific project, we, we have close collaboration with, with Brazilian institutions. Um, so we, we are trying to understand what are the risks associated with the current status of all our wells and what is the probability to have leakage on those wells. Um, and the last uh, project that we have uh, is Rigless PNA. So in that one, we uh, we are um, covering uh, PWC perforate perforation washing and cementing uh, operations. Uh, we have also um, tubing left in hole, and we have uh, control lines uh, experimental work related with the with uh, the improving of these uh, these technologies. So that was the thing that I will I was planning to share with with you. If you want more information about our activities, or if you have any solution that we can help you to develop, this is my my contact. So um, I would like to invite then um, uh, one of the operators to share with us um, one of the operators that is not part of our program to share with us uh, the, their status and their uh, development in technologies. So I would like to invite the first the Brazilian operator. I would like to invite Joao Waldini from Repsol. Hello, Catherine. <clears throat> Just a second, let me share my screen here. So I hope that I did a, a kind of okay uh, overview of the <laughs> no, it was challenges perfect. that we have and we can uh, discuss further more specific details just a second are you seeing my slide not now oh there's an issue in my PowerPoint here. Sorry about that, guys. I can uh, try to share your presentation. 
Yeah, no, there's a. I guess now it's okay. Let's see. No. Like if you want, I can share yeah, the presentation if you don't and you just. Uh, yeah, otherwise, we're gonna struggle with that. Okay. Um. Just a second. Yes. Um, can you see now your presentation? Just a second. I'm struggling with my computer here. Yeah, there was a crash, you know, in my in my PowerPoint. I think that so now I, I am I need able to open to... again. I I think that Sorry I am sharing. That. Don't worry. I'm sharing, so if you want, I can. We can start, and you can just uh, tell me when we can move. Just a second. Think that we we don't have Joao more online. Uh, he is back. Yeah, sorry about that. That was a a crash on my PowerPoint here. So don't can worry. you put a can you put a, the 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 presentation again? Yeah, sure. Okay, so can you see the presentation? Yeah, perfectly. All right, excellent. Are you have control or not? And uh, no, I need to okay. move your slides. All right. Oh, How no, are you please. have control? I'm not sure. Yeah. All right, sorry, sorry, audience, about the the this uh, this is the new normal, right? I hate the, the <laughs> term, but now we are operating from home, so it's a pleasure to to be invited to to this event. Uh, it's always good to be close to Norwegians. Uh, they are very good on on uh, on R and D and innovation, so it's uh, it's always a pleasure to to be part of this kind of event. So, Catherine, please go to the next one. Yeah, just to uh, give you guys a flavor, right? Uh, I, I don't want to be redundant here, but the plugin abandonment for for not only for us in Hapso, but for other companies, is all the sequence, right? To to close a well permanently. Uh, this is a very broad concept, right? Because permanently could be 100 years, 200 years, 300 years. And we are close to, to have a, a shift in mindset in our industry, especially for carbon storage wells. Uh, imagine to guarantee the permeability, the, to, to keep the gas, the CO2 in the well for 200 years, for 300 years. So it's something that we need to, to think better about. Uh, of course, there's a, a problem uh, you guys saw in the, the discussions about the changes in terms of regulation among countries and for uh, international companies like HEPSO. This is a, a challenge. We need to be adapted. We need to create uh, to level our standards uh, by the country. And of course, having a, 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 our own standard that's normal above all the, the country standards. So this is very complicated to manage, especially in the chains. You guys saw the, the change on NORSOC D10, revision five. We are anxious to see then there are a lot of uh, uh, change to happen. And of course we need to adapt. And uh, the main challenge, uh, p and is a complex operation because normally we are dealing with old stuffs, old wells, old subsea equipment. We have potential for environment, environment damage. And of course, uh, 
dealing with old stuff is, is always challenge. It's very complicated. Sometimes we struggle with a sub-C access. We cannot open the master one valve out of the Christmas tree and uh, the whole PNA will be jeopardized by that, right? So that's our reality on PNA. Please go to the next one. Yeah, uh, regarding that mention that I did regarding the chains, uh, we have been seeing some movements around the world uh, regarding the, the, the fugitive, right? Uh, uh, emissions, met methane is the, the best example. And of course, uh, in our industry, this kind of uh, pressure from stakeholders has potential to change everything in the industry. Uh, we need to reevaluate the, the typical solution, right? The Portland cement casing and bridge plug. Uh, and, and try to find something that is more reliable, especially uh, if you revisit, right, or re try to understand what is permeability in our industry. So you're not escaping from this discussion, but we need to think as a whole, as a, as a community, how to, to deal with this kind of obligation if uh, this change. We know that NORSOC uh, has been thinking on that, uh, trying to change, make changes on uh, barrier verification. And of course we need to adapt. And we count on the, the academia, the supply chain to help us to, to fulfill the, the new requirements. The next one, please. Just, just giving a flavor about uh, what is PNA for HAPSO, but uh, as, I don't know if the numbers are good to see. But the majority of the costs that we have uh, in decommissioning in HEPSO will be related to, to wells, to PNA. So it's a 76% in, uh, in Brazil, which is huge, right? We have uh, in Brazil Sapinhoal, Bacora Leste, Lapa, and uh, existing, uh, and we have a lot of things to be developed, so the number uh, you increase. And uh, in the world, we are talking about 52%. And remember that HEPSO has as a, a, a broad coverage uh, uh, in the world. We have land wells, we have uh, subsea, we have shallow water, we have a lot of developments in 25 countries. So it's, uh, it's, it's the majority of the cost to be related to PNA. So no doubt, but this is a very hot topic for us. The next one, please. So the, the dilemma that we face, right, on, on PNA, this is, is a very <laughs> complicated and somehow we are stuck in on that. Uh, of course, we need to, uh, when you have risk-based regulation, we have a, 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 a hidden uh, invitation to be more aggressive. Aggressive means uh, to thinking about different alternatives, to uh, try uh, different things, safe things, uh, but at the same time, just a second, uh, we do not, can, we cannot count on the data that we have from the past, uh, because the majority of the wells we did in a different reality without, uh, uh, logins, without proper, uh, written, the reports are, are not in a good quality, the, the, the world changed. So, especially when we are talking about, uh, 30 years old, 35 years old, well, uh, the data is, is not uh, enough for the requirements that we have today. And uh, when we are talking about PNA, normally we are thinking about a mature field, so there's no money or no budget to make a surveillance campaign to go in the well and get the data about the integrity. So we keep the blindness about the well. So do that, we need to be conservative in the approach uh, to, to estimate the cost and time. And of course, to be conservative, the ABEX, the, the abandonment cost, you'll be high. And for the company, you'll be uh, no attractive to, to start the campaign. So we struggle internally to, to make the, the PNA campaigns. Normally, the strategy that we have is to concentrate, to agglutinate, to create a sizable campaign in order to move forward. But sometimes this is not uh, so easy to, to do, right? And in general, PNA as an industry, not only HEPSO, 
is a, a non-continuous activity. We have like a, a spot, right? A, a, a PNA campaign here, one year later, another PNA campaign. So it's not a, a continued flow. And of course, there's a, a problems in terms of uh, getting a, a reasonable learning curve. Uh, we, we mob and demob the crew. That's not uh, the, a, a good thing to do. And uh, we have few examples of companies being fully dedicated to PNA. And the, the normal approach is to use the traditional drilling rigs to do PNA sometimes, especially the second, third, and fourth generation rigs in, in case of the offshore. Uh, in the ideal world, you need to be continuous, right? To have a specialized crew uh, getting the, the, the most in terms of performance. In the end, what happened for PNA? We have an execution few, full of surprise, and due of that, of course, uh, we have we get pressure from from our top manager. We need to be more conservative, so we are stuck in this cycle. And what we need to do to to change that, right? We need to act in some of these points, and uh, I'll explain a little bit later. Uh, regarding prescriptive regulation, it's pretty much the same, right? The main difference is the uh, we need to follow to be by the book, right? In, in the the original plan, but the, the cycle the cycle is is pretty much the same. The next slide, please. And another problem that we have on PNA, PNA is not a, a product uh, discipline, right? Uh, we do not have nothing to add in the well, right? So pretty much we're talking about a bridge plug, a cement, and uh, more or less is that, right? Some fluids, fluids sometimes. So PNA is a method and procedure discipline. So it's, it's very complicated to get uh, incentive from the service providers for the, the big companies to find solutions because they are selling uh, services and not products. So sometimes the margin and services, they, they are more closer to the commodity uh, side and not to the, the special, the high margin uh, offer. So it's, it's complicated to, to, to balance that. And we, we need as operator to understand this mechanism in order to, to make things happen, right? In terms of uh, technological development in PNA. The next one, please. So, uh, as you probably uh, saw already, the PNA technological development is pretty much new techniques for execution of some of them very innovative, but we are talking method and procedure. So the uh, the, the main problem of uh, introduce new technologies uh, related to service to execution, it's uh, we know that uh, there's there is risk. Uh, on uh, on try uh, a thing a new thing uh, and of course uh, we are talking about something PNA it's a high risk risk activity so it's it's complicated to manage that right we need to be conservative in terms of risk and safety at the same time we have appetite to test to make few trials of the new activities however. Uh, the match, the marriage, sometimes is not possible to do. So as operator, as industry, perhaps is, is, is included on that. We need to decide if you want to be the, the leader, uh, the operator will be someone to push, to, to put the, the spark in the industry to make things happen in terms of technological development, the leader. Or if you're going to stay, the, the market to bring the solutions, be the follower, and of course, the, the time uh, can be longer in this second approach. And it's, it's not what we need, right? Especially knowing that uh, PNA is a billion dollar uh, market. So the big, a big dollar market or big dollar problem, right? Depend on your, your view, right? The next one, please. So just to give you a flavor about what we have been doing in, in HEPSO, uh, we play a little bit uh, on being a follower or being the leader. Uh, we, ha we have two hats. Some, sometimes we, we stimulate market. Sometimes we try to be the, the, the pioneer. So we have 
<coughs> it was already mentioned, uh, the salt and shale creeping um, it is a possibility that we have been studying because it's like a natural cap rock. Uh, the permeability is extremely low, so the potential is very good. And of course, it's natural. There's no need to, to put anything artificial, pretty much just to leave the salt and shale to, to fill the cavity and become the seal. So this is, has potential to replace the cement Portland in some specific applications. Uh, we have been also a project related to, to get data in advance. Remember that I mentioned that we are stuck uh, and do, we do not normally have budget to make a surveillance campaign. So the well robot project is the, the idea is to, to have a fast, uh, reliable and mainly cheap solution to get the, the surveillance and PLT data from the well. So we can drop the robots uh, without any supervision and the, the robot you get the, all the data regarding the well and come back to the surface and then the PNA designers they can have all the details uh, videos and uh, surveys everything related to the well in order to make a better planning uh, of the the, the PNA or intervention campaign Logging through tubing is a holy grail for, for us. We are also uh, playing a little bit on that. Uh, of course, the, the potential to save costs is, is enormous. In, uh, if we are able to, to evaluate the cement without removing the production tubing. So we have been working with Oro Negro and Puki on that. And uh, the Ariel project is the idea um, that that mention that I did about the future, right? How to to control uh, and evaluate the size of a, a leakage if the leakage happen. So Ariel is a is autonomous vessel, a big one, five meters a vessel, combined with a drone. So the 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 vessel can sail in a de, uh, defined region to evaluate if some uh, oil or some contamination is happening in the seabed. The drone can be used together, combined to have a, a view and evaluate what's happening. And, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, call the, the shore to get the, the proper results, the, pro the proper resource to, to fill the, the leakage. And also we have a well test a pilot in Natal, in uh, Rio Grande do Norte state, to to make all the to play right as a playground for PNA engineers like myself, so we can uh, dive our our um, um, our robot in and make all the tests in our in controlled environment. So, Catherine, go back to the slide. Something happened. No, further. That one with the with the project, yeah. Another one more, yeah. So the the, the last picture is the, the the test well that we have in Rio Grande do Norte State, together with Geo Alex. Next one, please. And uh, the questions that uh, uh, we have been trying to to attack or to identify solutions uh, are related to, to that idea to streamline the subsea PNA execution and sometimes being follower or being leader. So we are focused on uh, reduce the uncertainties. So the idea of the robots, uh, digital tools, we need to play better with the data uh, and estimate costs better. We need to overcome problems of subsea access. So we need to have something to, to easily uh, fix the problems when happen. Uh, we are open to discuss integrated scope to have um, that idea that I mentioned, we do not have a continuity uh, in, the, in the execution of the PNA. I'm, I'm not only speaking by HEPSO, but I'm speaking by industry. Maybe we need to have someone doing a, a continuous job on PNA. We, ha we need to have a dedicated, uh, vessels and, and services toolbox for PNA. 
we need to think about scope simplification. Uh, Caterine touched on that. Is, is everything aligned? Rigless operation to reduce cost, logging through tubing, through tubing, perf wash and cement, plasma section milling, play a little bit with different alternatives. Let's melt down everything and open a rock to rock window to put the, the, the cement barrier. Self abandonment well, imagine it you just play a button and everything will melt down in the well and uh, and the termite you, you and bismuth, you make a, a, a barrier without no necessity of a rig. That is a kind of dream that we have here. Bismuth and termite plugs. Remember that I mentioned that problem related to the, to the permeability of Portland semen, especially for carbon storage. Maybe alternative materials are the answer. Increase of efficiency, reliability. Uh, Portland Sim is something that we need to, to think about, especially in the environments like we have here in Brazil with high CO2, high H2S, the hydration, uh, carbonation is a problem in, uh, in long term. Sour cement, as I mentioned, high efficiency cutting tools. We need to, to be more efficient on PNA, sometimes to overcome problems, sometimes to be efficient uh, as an extender. We need to have better solutions for section milling to swarf uh, treatment. So uh, it's, it's part of uh, our whole is R and D and innovation uh, to be focused and and try to look for this kind of uh, of uh, alternatives to reduce PNA. PNA is a, is a mature a mature market. It's a vast market with a lot of potential. Uh, but we need to evolve and we count on uh, universities and uh, service companies to, to progress on that. We need to, to save costs. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much for the, the opportunity and I'm open for questions in the end. Sorry for the problems again. I am so happy to see a PNA engineer that is so motivated to talk about this topic that for several years was like the topic that no one want to talk about so it's uh, it's very nice to see a person that is motivated to develop and move forward with this uh, sector of our industry too much motivated sometimes is a is mini for a dummy right but that's not the question <laughs> <laughs> Uh, being honest, we need to solve this problem, right? It's, it's a critical one. Uh, it's, it's not related to the energy transition. If you decide to shut down all the wells, we still need to, to close the wells to make the PNA. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So thank you so much, Joao. I will uh, be back with you with the, and with the Stainer uh, during the Q&A part. And now I would like to invite the Stainer Storm from Equinor. Yeah, hello there. Hello, Steiner. So, um, can you please uh, share your screen? Yeah, um, I'll try that. Um, can you see it? I think that. Um, Can you? Yeah, it's working. Um, I just would like to have a full screen and. Oh yeah, you see. Um, I think I should. Yeah, have, uh, now, it's, it, now it's working perfectly. So uh, welcome, Steiner. Uh, the audience is, is with you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Um, well, I'm, my intention is to give you a brief um, background in Equinor on uh, the, the challenges as we see it and. Um, the experience we got and uh, also some technology stuff in the end. As uh, you mentioned, Catherine, uh, we are not a part of this ongoing program at uh, North, but we uh, did take uh, an important part in the drill well program earlier on. So um, starting with the current challenges uh, as we see it, um, <clears throat> we do um, I kind of cover both permanent PNA and slot recovery here because um, we <laughs> The, sorry, Steiner, I think that the, they are not able to see now your presentation, so uh, I will just okay. ask you to try again. Yeah, let's see now. How do I stop this? Should I try to share again, or do you want to share screen? 
That's... I would like to ask for our IT support uh, to share the presentation, uh, your presentation. Can you see and the screen now? You can... Um, I would like to ask for the audience to inform us if you are able to see your, the presentation uh, now. It says uh, that I'm sharing here, but uh, can you see it? I'm confirming here, just a minute. Yeah. Uh, I, sh I think that is working now. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <coughs> Sorry uh, for the interruption. Uh, oh, that's fine. <laughs> uh, as I um, was mentioning, we are um, covering both both uh, slot recovery uh, and reuse of old wells and permanent PNA in this uh, presentation because we uh, we basically do mainly slot recovery these days, which of course uh, involves uh, a deep uh, barrier uh, in the well or two. <laughs> So on the slot recovery side, uh, the main challenges uh, that we see there is uh, reuse of the of, uh, old casings with uh, uncertain status. Um, the reservoir barriers in the motherboard must normally be established either by perforation cement, uh, section milling or whatever. And um, there is no uh, injection in the motherboard, the well is dead. So, um, Often uh, we have to go for uh, shallow side track, which is, is of course uh, very time consuming. So uh, it, because it involves a retrieval of old casing, which is often, very often actually stuck in settled barrett or cement. And um, also establishing uh, overburden barriers in uh, each bore is very time consuming. So on the fixed uh, units, we um, one issue there that we are working quite a lot on is to select the right wedge slot uh, versus uh, the drilling target. Um, in, especially on the our fixed units, we, we we have an available slot and the target is on the opposite side uh, of the platform. And of course, you have to drill all around the, all the existing wells, which is um, which basically ends up uh, accepting the well high. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's relatively cheap operations on the fixed units. We have um, we have um, uh, quite cheap uh, drilling rigs, so it's uh, hard to com to compete with that for uh, intervention-based uh, te techniques, which we are uh, working on. On the subsea wells, uh, the casing status is very often is, is basically unknown when we enter the well. We have no access uh, in in principle to the old uh, B and C NRI in the well. So um, on the permanent uh, PNA side, the issues are um, <clears throat> we basically want to leave the majority of the tubular in in the well, um, and thus reducing the time spent on pulling tubular. We have, we want to verify another cement or formation as barrier using available uh, information that we have, like uh, cement job uh, reports, logs, whatever. Um, very often uh, we have to pull uh, tubular just to be able to log it and uh, of course that, that is a challenge when the casing is stuck in Barrett or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and different scenarios require different solutions, uh, reference to the next slide. On the fixed units we, uh, we want to achieve batch operations. Uh, I mentioned the cheap rigs uh, that we have which is uh, Make it, makes it harder to use intervention-based techniques, uh, difficult to realize. On the subsea side, we have unknown casing uh, status as mentioned, and, uh, and we are working on intervention-based activities using a uh, riserless light well intervention vessel. I'll come back to that later. So just to mention it, the, the PNA is not just a PNA, it's a very much a difference uh, in the different scenarios here. This is our um, the latest uh, PNA jobs we did, uh, the Heimdall, it was a modular rig installed in. Uh, it's a gas field, so uh, that rig hasn't hadn't been uh, used since early 90s. So it had to be lifted off, and we use a modular rig instead from Archer, and uh, perform the the permanent PNA using that one. On the Stratford satellites, we have a uh, standard subsea wells uh, subsea well. Um, 
with uh, using a mobile, uh, mobile uh, drilling unit, uh, semi, and uh, subsea templates. On the Huldra, we had the jack-up rig, which uh, was used above an existing uh, platform, uh, production platform. All the wells were dry, so that was a, another scenario. And on the Volvo, we actually had a jack-up rig that was used as a production rig uh, unit. Um, it did have a drilling rig on board, so we used uh, we used this unit to perform the PNA. So um, it's a different uh, different uh, scenarios that we have to deal with in PNA. So uh, our experience, um, <clears throat> this is the, um, the typical uh, subsea well uh, PNA. We did the five. Um, uh, permanent PNA in five uh, on five wells uh, in two templates uh, with Biddeford dolphins a few years back. Uh, they were equipped with vertical Christmas trees. So what we saw there is that um, the batch operations were quite uh, efficient. Um, the well was uh, the wells uh, was uh, or the wells were temporary PNA with a light well intervention vessel, which, which we use quite frequently uh, prior to the rig uh, arrive on location. The first batch was to run the workover uh, riser system and uh, verify barriers, install tubing hanger plugs, and we jumped the workover system over to the next well on the same template, and, uh, and then the third one. Uh, the second batch uh, operation was to retrieve the vertical Christmas trees um, on all the three wells in that particular template using drill pipe. And the third batch was to run the BOP, retrieve tubing, and actually uh, do the permanent PNA in that particular well before we jump the BOP over to the next well. So, um, as you can see down to the right there, the budget time was 34 days, and we ended up with the actual time on 18 days per well, uh, including anchor handling. So, it's quite efficient uh, using batch operations. Well, this is basically the same. Um, uh, the Volvo uh, project was uh, kind of different. It, as I mentioned, it was uh, the Jacob Rig Mash, Mash Inspirer that was used uh, also as a production unit. And it did have a um, production riser installed on the wells. So th the the purpose was to do, uh, to perform the PNA through the production riser. This, uh, so we didn't have to um, change over to a drilling riser, which, which is uh, quite uh, time consuming. So we did all uh, the PNA work in uh, all the wells. I think it was 12 wells uh, through the 12.3 ID production riser. So that ensured no need for production shutdowns during the campaign until the last producer was plugged because we didn't have any, had to move any riser um, risers in, uh, on from the platform. What we did there was actually a combination of different techniques. Um, we, um, it varies for, varied from well to well, of course, but we, um, as you can see down here, we actually bulleted, uh, I think it was in five wells, uh, uh, cement into the formation, and we saw a quite significant uh, screen out effect when the cement hit the formation to establish the, the primary barrier in the, in the well. And then we used the tubing as a work string to establish the second barrier. We actually lift the tubing out of the well, uh, get rid of the uh, uh, tubing or the safety valve, and uh, run in again on drill pipe, and uh, just uh, place the cement as we would uh, with a conventional drill pipe. When the cement is placed as a balance plug, we pull the tubing above it and just wait for the cement to set up, and then we tag the cement uh, with the tubing, just setting basically the entire tubing weight down on it. That's um, actually not uh, entirely according to NORSOC DO10 because um, uh, we should uh, at least uh, when we if if this was two barriers we should have dressed off and tagged with uh, with uh, with a ten ton which is uh, basic is a drill pipe operation but we had an internal process and we ended up uh, this being acceptable just tag it with the tubing and uh, pressure test. So it worked uh, fine and it's quite uh, time efficient as well. So we left the majority of the tubing in the well. So the remaining part was the was the open hole to surface plug uh, up here. When we uh, matured this uh, Volvo project, we started off with uh, approximately 320 days. Um, 
uh, for the older wells. I don't uh, actually recall the exact number, but I think it was 12, uh, 12 wells uh, on Vol Volve. But uh, after maturing it through DG2 uh, and DG3, we ended up with uh, uh, 129 days uh, for the for the PNA operation. So, um, as was mentioned by Repsol uh, earlier, it's very important that we set up campaigns and uh, and do a thorough work uh, upfront. If we do if we do a PNA on a single well, that uh, that we, we rarely see that to be efficient. Yeah, so the average um, budget days was 17.2 and we ended up with 14 days uh, actual per well. On the technology side, um, <clears throat> we are working on different uh, things, but uh, one very hot topic now is through tubing logging, where we, the idea is to actually run the logging tool through, uh, through the tubing and, and see the cement outside the production casing through the, the packet fluid in the analysis. So um, it has been uh, ongoing for a while. I know that several uh, other operators are working on similar things. Uh, we are working with Schlumberger and the current uh, and the, the logging tools themselves are not uh, very new. It's uh, interpretation and uh, all the data that's, uh, that's a new process. So um, actually we are going to test this in uh, one of the wells up on at North. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's ongoing or uh, you to start soon, but uh, it will be logged. Uh, we will log a well with a with a known defect on the annulus, uh, on the second annulus from the from the bore. So and see how the effect is. And and if that uh, if that's okay, we will uh, accept it to um, technology readiness level four, as you can see down here, and it uh, is ready for uh, first use. We have run it uh, several times. Um, uh, earlier, um, where we are logged uh, first through tubing, and then we have uh, pulled the tubing and re-logged um, the casing, and it's a fairly good match. But the, this is machine learning, so we have to build the confidence in the, in the logging. Another uh, method that we use quite a lot is it's not very new uh, technology as such, but it's uh, put together in a new way. So, um, as I mentioned, we uh, very often pull. Uh, casing that is stuck in settled barrett. So what we do then is to actually perforate. Um, um, if you have a casing inside another casing that's uh, stuck in settled barrett, we perforate um, the inner casing and wash away the barrett. It's like a perforation cement method, but uh, without the cementing part. So we've done this several times with quite good uh, experience. Uh, we perforated uh, up to 400 meters. Um, and it, uh, it has uh, pro proven to be a quite efficient method that we use uh, from time to time. Another project that's ongoing, it's not realized yet, but it's, uh, it's uh, you're working offline uh, without a drilling rig on a, one of our, on a fixed platform. It's a Gulfax field that's a candidate here. So the, the idea is to to jack out a part, a small part of the of the tubing, and be able to establish a cement barrier down here, uh, possibly using a high bale system, which is basically a huge uh, cement baler, or uh, by circulation. That has to be has to be uh, determined. So that's uh, ongoing. And it's um, not really. Um, accepted to move, move forward, but uh, it's in a um, um, kind of development phase. Um, we are also working on um, pulling tubing in open sea. Uh, that's uh, particularly for uh, slot recovery activities. Uh, if you have wells equipped with the horizontal trees, which we uh, have a lot of, um, we have to, uh, as you probably know, we have to land the BOP on the uh, horizontal Christmas tree first, and then uh, pull the tubing, uh, log the casing, and then first, then uh, at that point, you are really know what you have to do in the well. Then we have to pull the BOP, uh, pull the tree, and then uh, re land the BOP on the wellhead. So uh, the idea here is to actually. Um, as I mentioned, we do pre-PNA regularly on very many subsea wells before the rig enters. So we just uh, add on to that pre-PNA activity. Uh, 
uh, which is uh, setting a deep plug and kill the well, uh, pulling tubing, and uh, log the 958 inch casing um, a few months before the rig arrives. In the meantime, there, an uh, inspection, maintenance, and repair vessel will uh, um, pull the horizontal Christmas tree. So when, when the rig uh, arrives, it could uh, land the BOP right on top of the well lead. And, uh, and at that point, they, they know what the status of the production casing and what they have to do in the well. Currently, we have to line up several contingency op options uh, like uh, perforce and cement or milling or whatever. So um, so it's, um, it's a very much uh, planning. Uh, it will release uh, or um, improve the planning part of the of the slot recovery. Another thing that we have quite uh, started to use quite a lot now is a uh, listing tool. We, um, it's a commercial product, so it's not any new um, technology as such, it, but uh, in Norway it has, it's quite new. So we have uh, used uh, that quite a lot on, uh, on uh, Gulfax to um, basically for wells in operation to to find out whether it's uh, it's any movement of uh, fluids or gas or uh, behind the casing uh, and you can see through several casings so um, and in the longer perspective we might be able to use the same technology to qualify barriers if you can see uh, if you don't see any movement of fluids if there is a pressure differential there's good reason to believe that it's no uh, that it's a good barrier but we are not at that uh, point yet. So the, uh, this slide there, or this picture, is from uh, a job that we did on uh, Kvitiburn, an X-Lot in the Balder formation. As you can see, uh, it's uh, quite good cement here, up here, and down here. But um, we pumped about uh, one and a half cubic meter in here per uh, per cycle. So. Um, so um, and you can see that the noise here it uh, kind of concentrated to the to the area where the pure, pure cement is the the bald. We see we see uh, very often that in sand deformations or sand formation uh, we get the poor bonding on the on the log, but in this case we had good bonding up here and, and down here, so it kind of uh, uh, confirmed what we believed. So. As an alternative, to just pump through and see what you have got on surface. We, we can have this as an additional um, verification of what we are doing in the vault. So it's um, quite a useful experience for us. Just uh, coming back to the, the pulling tubing on, uh, on uh, with the vessel, um, we see that as, as a starting point towards pulling or performing complete permanent PNA using a vessel. So this is step one, is pull the tubing in open sea. Of course, we can pump, uh, and that has been done, of course, by others, uh, pump, uh, pump cement uh, through the tubing or through an adapter uh, placed below the well control package for the light uh, well intervention vessel. So the main uh, issue, as we see it, is the, is the intermediate barriers, the overburden barriers. Uh, because we very often have several ca uh, casings there in that area of the well that needs to be uh, um, where we have to place a barrier and is very often stuck in uh, Barrett and so and such. So um, we do have an <coughs> ongoing project that uh, I know ConocoPhillips is a part of, which um, um, we are looking at maybe using perforce and cement in, uh, in, in two annuli here. So if you, but it's very difficult to, uh, to verify that uh, barrier uh, currently. So what we are looking at uh, to, together with our um, uh, partners is, um, and Hydrobel is of course involved in this uh, work as well, is to release uh, helium below the, the double barrier or the barrier in, in a double casing and, and see if you can sniff any and the helium on, on top of the barrier. That could be an option, but we, uh, this is a challenging, uh, or at least this, this I mean, uh, step three is very challenging. And uh, of course, in the end here, we have to remove stuff and that's uh, basically existing technology. So um, we hope uh, that within a month's time, we get uh, approval to go ahead with pool tubing in open sea, um, and we can take it from there basically. 
as you may have recalled in the end or in the start here, I just go back there quickly, just to see our um, <coughs> our plans for a PNA, uh, a permanent PNA. It tends to move a year for every year that uh, that uh, pass by, but uh, we do a yearly asset retirement obligation study. Uh, this one is from 2019. So uh, as you can see here, uh, this basically a very limited uh, number of PNAs uh, before 2030. And in these numbers, the Saturday day uh, was planned to be, to be PNA, but uh, due to this new unit that are uh, working with uh, late life uh, field extensions, um, Statford uh, A is now um, will be prolonged. It uh, is now due for PNA in 2627. So um, we haven't uh, really uh, hit the wave yet, but um, it will come at some point. And we do have a, a total of 1360 volts approximately uh, due for PNA in the, in the years to come. Um, we are um, well about 40 percent are subsidy and. Uh, and 60% uh, on the dry wallets, but um, on the cost side, it's uh, the opposite. 60% uh, cost related to sub wells and 40 on uh, fixed units. So I think that's about it, um, Catherine. Thank you so much, Steiner, for uh, for your presentation. I think that was um, clear and quite detailed in the in terms of the operations, and I think that that bring a very nice discussion later uh, today. Um, just as a, uh, as a comment, uh, I think that in Brazil we uh, we have a high uh, or more subsea wells, so it's uh, it will be interesting to see how we can exchange uh, a knowledge between uh, Brazil and Norway in 2030 or before to plan. Uh, opportunities to improve to see uh, PNA. So thank you so much you, for bringing thank that you. as well. Thank you. Um, well, uh, this webinar is also an opportunity uh, to present new projects that are starting. Uh, Repsol, Equinor and NORS have, um, have been working close to Brazilian institutions in the last years. Um, and as a result, we have a strong partnership with the universities and Equinor has, for example, operations in Brazil and Norway. Um, but it's always uh, an opportunity to uh, have closer cooperation. So in the next se uh, session, I would like to, to invite a couple of um, Norwegian uh, presenters to speak a little bit or talk a, a little bit about the plans that they have to to strengthen cooperation in Brazil and new uh, projects. So first, I would uh, I would like to invite a, a Professor Oystein Arild the, um, from the University of Stavanger. Uh, he is the head of the petroleum department at the university, and he will present a little bit about the new projects that they have. So welcome, Oystein. Thank you. Okay, share screen. I will let you know. Uh, yeah, we can see. Okay, so uh, I'll just uh, spend uh, some minutes now on uh, telling you about Branor. Um, it's uh, knowledge sharing between the Nor Norwegian continental shelf and the Brazilian offshore on well abandonment. Uh, but before we go into that uh, project, I'd just like uh, to say a little bit about the University of Stavanger. Uh, we are not the largest university in uh, Stavanger, but in terms of uh, petroleum and the number of petroleum research and the number of uh, master students that we are graduating annually, uh, we are the largest. So it's about uh, each year 100 um, petroleum engineering and petroleum geoscience students from all over the world are graduating from our universities. Uh, from a university and PNA is one of our key research areas. Um, we are um, uh, we have also uh, published uh, the very first uh, textbook on uh, PNA that you can see to the to the right there that we now use in in one of our courses. And as you can see uh, from uh, Steina's presentation there, that uh, big wave that is coming that means that uh, the students that are graduating in the coming years they should have 
PA as part of the uh, curriculum. Okay. Uh, Brano is not a typical research project in that sense. It's a networking uh, project. Uh, Norwegian authorities, uh, represented by the Research Council of Norway, they have something called the INTPART program. And the purpose of that is, uh, is actually to um, strengthen uh, primarily uh, Norwegian institutions, of course, uh, in term, uh, by, by uh, letting them uh, collaborate with strong academic uh, institutions uh, all over the world. And you can see in this text that uh, among them uh, is Brazil. Brazil is, is among the prioritized countries. Um, um, so it's um, uh, in this program, the focus is both on education and on research. And as you can see there at the, the secondary goals, um, the, they, they highlight things that uh, higher education and research should go hand in hand. And that is something I, I strongly agree with. Uh, if you have research within a topic at your university, the, the teaching uh, typically becomes uh, better within that field as well. Uh, high level overview here of the partners on the Brazilian side, it's UFRJ in Rio, it's PUCI in Rio, it's ITA in Sao Paulo, and it's Unicamp in Campinas. Uh, on the Norwegian side, it's uh, the University of Stavanger, uh, Mahmoud Khalifa is the project manager for the whole project. So we are the host um, of, the pro of the project and it's Norse in Stavanger. So what is the content? So this is not, uh, as I said, this is not the usual research project where you conduct uh, research to obtain something in particular. It's a networking project. So uh, the key four, four key activities here, I'll just uh, tell you a little bit about uh, those. On the education side, uh, we have the ambition to establish an online course in PNA with open access. So it means that both academia and industry partners can get access uh, to that course. Uh, or PNA lectures will be open to Brazilian students. Uh, because of the corona situation, this, uh, this uh, gave us a good start because now we are actually streaming all our lectures uh, because of the situation. Uh, and we're planning summer schools in PNA. Uh, on joint supervision and mobility, it's natural to exchange PhD students and master students and postdoc and staff. Uh, and also we will be working on if we can establish joint degrees that we think will be um, uh, relatively popular among the students because it shows that you have an international profile when you, um, when you graduate from either uh, University of Stavanger or the Brazilian universities involved. For the workshops, uh, we'll have binational workshops and um, well, as a kickstart, we already have a, a binational workshop in uh, in Rio, just before the academic, uh, before the pandemic hit uh, hit us, um, and on project development, uh, we will be trying to establish specific research projects. And later on, I'll give you a, a quick uh, overview of one of those projects that already are rolling. Uh, very quickly here, as you can see, the, the budget is not large. It's four and a half million Norwegian crowns divided uh, on all uh, partners. But we are ambitious here and we want the activities to be interesting to um, uh, the industry. And therefore, we have an ambition to get additional funding. Here is an example of a project uh, between Norse and UAS on the Norwegian side uh, and uh, UFRJ and Petros and FINAP on the Brazilian side. The, the key thing here is that um, Norse have developed uh, a risk-based approach to how to, for how to evaluate the wells in the planning phase. Uh, it's called the leakage risk calculator. Uh, the Brazilians are also very interested in, in this approach and they have quite a lot of wells uh, to be abandoned and they would like to um, uh, potentially use this tool. I'll show you a little bit uh, in the next slide, li a little bit more detailed. But they are also interested in the environmental impact in case such wells are starting to leak, which is also of interest on the Norwegian side. So basically what we have done here is that 
uh, we have common interest, but uh, the Norwegian side has taken responsibility for one part of it, and the Brazilian side has taken responsibility for one part of it, and then we'll share re uh, the results. So it benefits uh, both parties. Uh, a little bit uh, crowded slide here, but if you look at uh, the green uh, zone in the middle there, uh, the idea is that uh, we'll take two representative PNA wells on the Brazilian side, and then we will conduct risk analysis of those wells. And that can be done uh, in two ways. Uh, it can be done using the leakage calculator that we have at NORS, uh, which is now um, uh, being further developed as well, because we have so much results from um, uh, the experiments that's ongoing at the, the Ulrich uh, area with, uh, with real test cells that have been pulled uh, out, out from the North Sea. Um, from the database on the Brazilian side, we are thinking of, uh, well, a machine learning model or uh, running some statistics that could give us additional information and be combined with the leakage risk um, to the uh, leakage risk model that we have at, um, at NORS. Uh, the next steps then are to say something about, um, of course, um, when we when we plug an abandoned well uh, permanently, uh, we have no intent. The intention is that it shall never leak, uh, no hydrocarbons at all. But you know, in a risk-based approach, there will always be um, a probability that this is occurring, although it's not um, desired. Um, and then the question becomes, if they start, uh, if it starts to leak, what should we do? Uh, because it has some environmental consequences, potentially. Um, and then it has cost consequences, because you may have to go down and stop the leak. Um, and that, again, is so. Um, if you look at that whole chain there, um, by connecting the environmental consequences and the technical risk analysis, you can actually um, you can actually um, go all the way back to the design of the well to decide if the risk is acceptable or not. So that's kind of the end part of that analysis chain. So, uh, for example. Um, if the risk says that uh, you know there's a two percent, well, it's uh, probably much lower than that. But say it's two percent uh, chance of leakage, and that there is um, there is a certain leakage rate of methane, which is very very low. Uh, then the environmental analysis would say that uh, this is acceptable. This is not uh, damaging uh, in the long term to the environment, and therefore uh, the design of this well is acceptable okay i think that's what i had to to share catherine thank you so much oh i um, uh, we will have open for questions in uh, a few minutes with you Thank so you. I would like to invite now um, Harald Linger from uh, Sintef. He's going to present to us um, SWIPA, that is a new center for subsurface well integrity um, and PNA, um, where they plan to involve uh, some Brazilian universities. Uh, so I would like to war give a warm welcome to Harald now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Now you are here and not anymore. So uh, in the meanwhile, if you have uh, questions uh, for the previous um, speakers, I would like to ask you to write the questions in the in the comments. Okay. Now I can hear you and I can see you. So if you, you can see, this, see the screen also. Uh, yep, now I can see your presentation. So the audience is, is with you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will present for you the Innovation Center SWIPA, which uh, <coughs> is an abbrevi abbreviation of Subsurface Well Integrity, Plugging and Abandonment. 
So I, I will be, I'm heading this center and have been in contact with a few of you in, uh, in Brazil. For the topics today, I will start with um, describing the SFI scheme. What is this? What are the objectives? And key business case, I will illustrate, uh, summarize for you the partners, how we are organized, what are the work packages, and uh, typical applications, and finally, the way forward uh, towards the establishment and uh, what we consider as impact. The frame for such centers is um, decided by the Research Council of Norway. So it's, it's a long-term innovation center, duration eight years, and it's supported by the Research Council uh, with um, maximum 12 million Norwegian kroner a year. So approximately divided by 10, you get the US million dollar number. It requires also financing from industry uh, at least 5% of the total budget. The overall scope as defined by the Research Council is to strengthen the innovation capability and also enhance the value creation for Norwegian industry through long-term R&D. When selecting uh, such centers, the committee consider the potential for innovation, what could be the potential for industrial development. It also relates to value, sustainable value creation, and finally, international um, level in terms of science. Uh, what we have defined for SWIFA uh, as a key objective is to obtain a scientific understanding of permanent well barriers and by this allocate to include well barrier design methodologies. Uh, the benefit will relate to the well integrity and addressing what has been discussed earlier today, cost, materials, lengths and operations. And finally, we also consider reuse or alternative applications. That means uh, what could be the potential for converting petroleum wells into other applications, storage of gases such as CO2 and hydrogen, and also utilize the know-how from SWIFA towards material repository and geothermal operations, where also well integrity is very important. Um, the center granted um, uh, the host institution is Sinta, and we are partnering with North IFE, and which Institute for Energy Technology, and the universities NTNU and the uh, University of Stavanger. As um, industry partners, we have uh, in the, for the application listed. Uh, five oil companies, operating companies, and a total of uh, 23 uh, product service companies and organization as listed here in green. So these companies are covering a very small innovative companies towards the large ones. And the operating companies uh, are the oper our financing partners, whereas uh, the other companies are defined as the in-kind contributors, contributing partners. Uh, so that means we have uh, different requirements for participation when it comes to operating companies versus other partners. We also, for the international science and higher level, we have uh, included a total of 11 universities as international academic partners. And um, among these, we have uh, six Brazilian universities represented uh, as seen in the, in the yellow um, rows here. I will not go into details. This will be probably distributed afterwards. So how are we organized? 
Um, we have a board where the user partners, the operating companies are, will have the majority and will decide on work plans. We also have a scientific committee where all the universities are uh, represented and it's led by a university, either NTMU or University of Stavanger. Additionally, we have a committee on innovations where all the industry partners are represented. Uh, finally, we have uh, organized uh, the, the activities in work package. Uh, one, in on, one is on well barrier materials, one on, is on barriers for storage and disposal, one on upscaling and testing, and one on innovations. And these are led by the different research organizations in Norway. But we also continue to each other's work packages. So, synthesis hosting the center. Uh, <clears throat> we have uh, the two work packages, one and two, related to um, low technical readiness level, uh, bringing this up to upscaling testing in the work back three and towards the innovation and or towards the commercialization we are addressing how to promote innovation and further um, support technology qualification and that is carried out in work package four and this work package four also is very important um, uh, vehicle for um, generating project spin-offs, uh, which can be sponsored or organized differently outside the innovation center. It can include uh, cooperation with the oil and gas technology center in the UK. It can be joint industry projects, single client projects. Uh, it can be researcher projects and so on. When it comes to the technical readiness scale and the sweet bar indicated in this green box. Uh, we are covering uh, up to, uh, from low technical readiness level up to what we call pilot testing. And this uh, I also illustrated ongoing projects where some of the companies uh, represent today are participating. It is, uh, as an example, we have the Synthet KPM Shared Barrier Toolbox and we have the program uh, presented by, already presented by Catherine, the p &A Innovation Program by NOR. So this illustrates where we are on the propriety for the qualification scale. We will not go into further details here. Um, just we have made now a work plan for next year. Um, this uh, illustrates uh, the startup. We have uh, just a few uh, keywords there. We have included sealing ability for pegging materials. We have included dismet applications, uh, self healing behavior, pre properties of shared barriers. Um, cement handling, a scale-up study, and uh, innovation and technology development, but we have a, we'll have a continuous uh, uh, collaboration with national authorities, as an example. We have uh, also, we've lost initiated PhD studies, and we will also employ postdocs in the different programs or projects within the center. Work package one, well barrier materials and integrity, as I said, we will target fundamental understanding of different barrier materials and uh, explore barrier acceptance criteria, targeting fit for purpose risk based approach to PNA. And this will be important, very important for. Uh, enhancing, promoting new products and services. Next, work page two, barriers for storage and disposal. 
where we will address the um, uh, specific well integrity applications, and not only PNA, but also uh, selected energy applications. Uh, let's, that means storage for instance of hydrogen, CO2, and uh, geothermal, and so on. So this will um, result in uh, potential new innovations related to new solutions and guidelines. Third work package, upscaling and testing. Um, that relates to investigating physical and operational scaling effects and uh, clearly testing under relevant conditions. That means uh, larger dimensions, uh, higher pressure, higher temperature, as uh, close to realistic as possible. That's the responsibility of NOR. Uh, examples here are barrier performance elevation and uh, qualification and modeling of well barriers. When it comes to the final technical work package, um, we will, um, uh, within a committee, review and prioritize resource innovation and innovations towards further technology qualification. We will have close communication with national authorities, uh, such as the uh, Petroleum Safety Authority of Norway and other uh, international authorities. Technical audits will be also part of this. Um, the Petroleum Safety Authority of Norway will be uh, uh, important to communicate with and collaborate with as they have as they are setting the regulations so we'll have a close dialogue and um, uh, the director of professional competence in uh, PSA um, states that uh, this is uh, it states that the collaboration with other country, countries are very important he addresses the International Regulator Forum, Austro Petroleum, uh, including also Brazil. So, uh, Mr. Carlson uh, identified PA as uh, one of the main topics for the joint international collaborations among the authorities. Uh, this will be the topics addressed in CIFA are. Uh, several. I will not go into details here, uh, just illustrating what we will target. Uh, start with some of them, with illustrating the identified activities next year. Sealing properties, uh, verification of barrier integrity, uh, PNA tools and operations, and evaluation of results. So, now uh, we are approaching the formal establishment of the consortium. Um, for the application, we received the uh, LOIs from uh, Equino, from the to Tetola and Petrobras. Um, the plan is to have an, a particip participation fee, uh, 3.5 million Norwegian per year. Um, when it comes to the operating part, companies, we have also got uh, a confirmation from Wintersal later on, now that they have confirmed their participation. Uh, discussion with other operating companies are ongoing. For the in-kind partners, it's uh, um, a fairly small amount uh, set for in-kind contribution, uh, 100,000 Norwegian kroner per year. We are now working with a consortium agreement uh, where the due date is uh, early January. When it comes to impact, uh, we got received considerable att attention from uh, partner companies uh, and also this has been uh, addressed by several uh, media, professional media centers in, in the world, uh, as you can see here. So that concludes my presentation.
Thank you so much, Harald, for your presentation. Um, and now I would like to invite then uh, the other speakers uh, to be here with us. Uh, and if you have any question that you want to do to the uh, panelists, I, I will be happy to share those questions with them, the speakers. So we have now here between uh, with us uh, Ademar from the Norwegian Energy Partners. Um, I will, would like just uh, to say that the Innovation Norway has three offices outside Norway, and one of these offices is in Rio de Janeiro. So that means that the Brazil is really important for the for the Norwegian government and Norwegian institutions. Uh, and also, uh, Norwegian Energy Partners have uh, are represented in uh, in Brazil. That is Ademar. So I would like to uh, invite Ademar here to to help help us with the questions and answers, and to present Ademar to the to the audience as well. So yeah, and also I would like to say thank you everybody for your uh, presentation sometime. I think that this uh, event was nice. Uh, we, we present quite uh, hot topics for the industry. Uh, and then I would like to start uh, for a question to, that was asked to Nina um, that was made by Interworld. And it says, uh, it looks like the um, um, activity regulation and securing wells were applied to wells that have been in temporary abandonment or closed for some years. Uh, did the operators have sufficient time to adapt to new rules when you change their regulation? Yeah, that's uh, a very good uh, question. Uh, but normally we use what we call the, uh, the grant public source uh, when it comes to changes uh, in regulation uh, in Norway. So we changed regulations in uh, January 2014, uh, and that means that wells uh, that were left uh, or temporarily abandoned uh, before that date, uh, they are kind of uh, governed by uh, the old regulation. So I hope that was uh, yeah, uh, Thank you for the, the, the response, Nina. There is another one for you that's from Marcelo. Uh, the question is how the activity regulation securing wells were applied to wells that had been in temporary abandonment or closed for years. Did the operators had sufficient time to adapt to new rules? I think that was uh, was the same uh, question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, another one uh, from uh, Interwell. Uh, if correct, uh, uh, dear Nina, uh, in our presentation, in your presentation, it seems there is an increase of wells falling uh, on the barrier failure or degradation during last years. If correct, which are the reasons caused by uh, call and calls that PSA has identified for those cases? and which are the actions taken by your agency? Yeah, uh, I think um, the most important thing to, to answer there or the message from, uh, back, uh, back to Interwell is that uh, of those uh, 24 um, wells that are currently categorized as uh, red and orange, uh, 16 of them have been temporarily plugged for more uh, than three years uh, and some uh, some for uh, even longer than uh, 2014. Uh, the reason for why uh, some of those numbers uh, with respect to the red and, uh, and orange wells have increased uh, during the last years are kind of uh, uh, yeah, a mix, there's a mixed explanation uh, one of them is that some operators have done what you call a reclassification uh, of the wells, according to NOROG 117. Uh, and also uh, the uh, currently Equinor uh, operated Martin Linge field 
uh, has contributed with five uh, of the six uh, red wells, and that uh, kind of uh, yeah, wells that have transferred from one to the other, uh, and they have different categories they station. So we we believe that uh, the current picture of uh, of the risk level based upon the well integrity categorization as per today is giving uh, quite a good uh, kind of uh, view of uh, of the risk related to to the wells. Okay, the next question is for Mariana and is for Interwell as well. Um, and it says once identified by well that update that uh, a particular operator is not complying with regulation uh, for temporary or permanent uh, abandon, which are the actions taken by NLP? Well, um, thank you for the question. Uh, depends on the risk of the non-conformancy. If it's a high risk and uh, emergency can occur, then um, it's uh, uh, immediate uh, um, fix activity they have to do and uh, find that they they can uh, defend themselves in the process. But if it's a um, uh, uh, lower risk, depending on how the uh, no conformity is, we can give no conformity with uh, 30 days to fix, 90 or 180, depends on the classification of the no conformity. So depends. Thank you, Mariana. And uh, there is another question for you here from Hussein. Uh, what is the most commonly used method of PNA in Brazil? And is the PWC method performed in Brazil, particularly for onshore wells? Well, um, regarding our data, I cannot confirm the methodology used for well abandonment, but for uh, like my uh, as a common sense from the meetings we have and audits, I can say that uh, PWC is not commonly used for onshore wells uh, here in Brazil, and the most common is uh, permanent uh, two permanent barriers uh, with uh, cement and um, perforate cut and removal for onshore wells. They even fill with cement from above very the most simple way, let's say like that. The okay, we simple and cheap, but uh, safe. Uh, we have um, ne the next question is for Steiner. Um, is from Hossein as well. He's asking if CCR uh, work based on jet cleaning. Well, we, it's not uh, jet cleaning, it's a cup uh, type uh, perforation cement, uh, perforation wash uh, method. We, we dimension the perforations to not uh, damage the outer casing and uh, use cups to circle it out. Thank you, Steiner. Um... The next question. Uh... Yeah, there is one question from, from to João. Mm -hmm. uh, is the Ariel project already in operation in uh, RG, RGM? No, no, not yet. the The project is in a um, in a pilot stage. Uh, actually, you put the vessel to sail in Guanabara Bay here in Rio de Janeiro a, a month ago, two months ago. So we are we are still playing with the the toy, right? But it's, it's not fully available yet. Yeah, I would like uh, also to ask Steiner and Joao, how do you see uh, the future opportunities to cooperate uh, as operators with uh, institutions in both countries, uh, research institute, institutes and universities? Uh, I do believe this is the the, the way to move forward, because we are uh, unfortunately in a very bad situation in the industry, the budgets are decreasing for, for R&D, innovation, all the companies. So the all the partnership is more than welcome, not only to, to, to make things happen, but also 
to to start or to increase the the speed or the velocity to to have the technology ready to go right because uh, the current way that we are doing r and d in general are in silos right norwegian people uh, alone brazilian people alone no communication no interaction so the mention that we did oh uh, in brazil have subsea wells in in or is, is a different thing uh, why not just to scale up what you guys are doing in in Norway and adapt to brazilian reality that's the at least apparently the the way to to speed up the development right why not to collaborate with uh, my friend from Equinor and bring that idea to brazil in a in hapso assets in brazil or even there in Norway, right uh, why not? Uh, we, we are not rich anymore, right? Uh, we are in a poor stage yeah. now. We need to collaborate, <laughs> otherwise you'll be dead, right? In the water here. No, I certainly agree with you, Shaw. So um, we do have a, actually a quite good uh, cooperation ship between the operators here in Norway. So uh, including Repsol in, in Norway. So of course we have a link there to you as well. But uh, my hope is that the university could contribute to, um, to as Øystein already touched into, what is really a good barrier? You know, nobody knows. So uh, that is the main challenge. And, so. and maybe I would like to ask the same for the operators. How do you see um, the opportunities to cooperate? I know that uh, some oper operate, the regulators have a, kind of a consor consortium and then you exchange knowledge. So how do you see the opportunities to work together to move forward in p and uh, regulation? Who was that question to? Was it to us? As for the regulators. Okay. Okay, I don't want the, to start. Now I think it's uh, it's good to to share the the kind of uh, standards that we are uh, referring to, uh, and see whether there are. Uh, yeah, also that we are aligned, or if there are kind of major yeah, so discrepancies or or areas we we possibly need to look into, because I think yeah, uh, I think the requirements for PNA should be kind of uh, yeah equal um, between the different um, uh, regions or the different uh, sectors actually. Yeah. Well. <clears throat> Just to um, to um, include a little bit, uh, ANP is uh, really uh, review their our own regulation based on the best practices and other regulator, and we follow a lot of uh, PSA revisions. So, as someone mentioned, we are anxious to see the NORSOC uh, revision published because um, our regulation is also performance-based. So the operator can choose the best practice they want to follow. And um, it's good to, to know how other regulators um, react to some uh, operators' uh, requests and uh, some industries' moves. So for us, we've been, um, we have a technical cooperation signed with PSA this year, 2020, so we hope to exchange a lot next uh, next year that's very nice to hear um i don't know if any of you have a question for other speaker before we close the webinar i, ju I just want to to ask uh, all of you to uh, continue studying researching technology because at least here in brazil uh, we are pushing the industry to do the pna and not to postpone anymore and also to monitor our wells because if you're not looking for it we don't know what's going on there and uh, we want to protect uh, our people and our environment so count on us and i'm very happy to hear all your uh, research thank you very much So I think that we we are ready to close and um
It's okay. Uh, so I try to thank you very much for, for being so active in the in participation in the Q and A session. Uh, we hope that bringing together regulators, uh, oil companies, universities, and the research institutes from both countries to share good and useful information with each other through webinars like this can result in limiting the decline in the global offshore market. The commissioning is a, is a growing market. As mentioned by ENP in the first session, the total decommissioned expenditure in the world is expected to reach 85 billion US dollars in the next decade. And there are many opportunities to enhance value creation and also technical challenges to be addressed. A major share of this, perhaps 45 to 50% is PNA of wealth. No app expects the decommissioning market globally will, the next three to four years, strengthen in other markets as well, like Norway and Brazil, but also U.S. Gulf of Mexico, Canada, and Mexico. I don't know if you are aware that EMP companies in Norway, like Equinor, has worked for decades close together with Norwegian research centers, universities, and Norwegian suppliers to develop solutions for their challenges. And the same we can see that is happening in Brazil. I want to close the web, this webinar today by saying, thank you very much to all speakers for very interesting presentations and discussions in the commissioning and the well PNA. I hope you find opportunities to, to have fruitful discussions with the different speakers following this webinar and having good reflections. Also, a warm thank you on behalf of Moss, Sobena, and NOEP to each participant in the audience today for being part of the webinar and for the participation on the Q&A session. We also thank BN21, Innovation Norway, and the Norwegian Ministry of Petroleum Energy for hosting this webinar within the November Conference 2020. We also hope that you can join us next again next year for another round of discussions when the November conference will take place once again as part of the Brazil-Norway weeks. Thank you again for making this webinar a success. Stay safe and stay healthy and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.